Uh, tonight we are very lucky to have a visiting artist in our midst, and we, Lynn Myers will present soon. But I want to uh, promote two upcoming events. Uh, first and foremost is the Kenilworth Open Studios, which I highly recommend uh, everyone check out, especially the non-art majors. Uh, on last week's post, when many people were posting in my class about uh, Nicole Jacquard's talk, saying, oh, I wish we had a digital fabrication lab, and we had the tools and the resources and the teachers that she talked about, well, we have that. Uh, Kevin Ward on the third floor has that. There's much more, and that whole building is full of art, from music, to film, to dance, to visual arts. Uh, and this Saturday from 11 to 2 is the open house, where you're going to see studios are open, uh, different majors are showcasing what they do. Uh, stop on by. It's an event that's open, free and open to the whole public, and it's something that you should hype up to uh, your friends, families, neighbors, and so on. Uh, it's a great event, so uh, check it out, and you can learn a lot. A lot of the art majors as well can learn a lot to see a lot of the new majors, technologies on display. So this Saturday, uh, please check out the Kenilworth Open House. If you're not familiar where the Kenilworth building it is, it's in the east side, you know, it's kind of near the land, you know, Oriental Theater, uh, and so on, Utrecht, Beans and Barley. On the ground floor, there's an Urban Outfitters. I'm sure you folks have seen that. Uh, the top three floors, besides the Innova, is all uh, UW on Tech School of the Arts, so come by if you can. Uh, next week is our last uh, Artist Now, so please join us uh, for our last uh, uh, session of the Artist Now talks for this semester. It's actually my guest, uh, Dylan Miner, uh, who is a professor at Michigan State. He is a PhD in art history, and he's also a practicing visual artist who works across disciplines, painting, sculpture, installation. Uh, he talks mostly about indigenous issues, about uh, indigenous sovereignty issues. His work is very it's fascinating. He's shown all over the world. He works individually, collectively. He's a great speaker as well. So uh, join us for Dylan Miner uh, next week. I sent out an email to the art grads that Dylan can do uh, <coughs> studio visits on Thursday. So check out that email and email me because it'll be on a first serve, first basis for uh, studio critiques with Dylan. Um, I'll introduce Leslie in a second. We have cold weather, so thanks for coming out. Uh, many of you may or may not know, you can probably hear my accent when I always say idea and attach an art to it, uh, always in the wrong places. Uh, I grew up in Boston, so this has been a really, really tough, tough week. Uh, Monday, my brother was two blocks away from the explosion, so it's been a uh, really, really hard week, and my heart goes out to everyone in that city. Uh, <coughs> my family, so. Anyway, uh, Let's pull through. Art makes us strong, right? Very resilient uh, public, very resilient population. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, Leslie Vance is going to introduce our guest. Is this okay? Thank you very much. It was I'd like to welcome you to the 2012-2013 John Cope Lecture. Um, John was our colleague until about 10 years ago, and his wife established the John Cope Fund in his name, so this is tonight's lecture is, is this year's speaker. Um, we are welcoming Lynn Myers, who comes to us from Washington, D.C., uh, where she lives and works full-time on and in support of her artwork. That's very wonderful life to be with. Um, Lynn earned her BFA in painting from the Union in New York and her MFA in painting from the California College of Arts in the early 1990s. She, since that time, she has received numerous grants, fellowships, and residency opportunities. And these have ranged from opportunities in DC, the Smithsonian and the Hirshhorn uh, Museums, for instance, but also in the Midwest, the Bemis Center in Omaha, Nebraska, in Pittsburgh at the Frist Center, the Tamarin Institute in New Mexico, and at San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art in California. Uh, her record of exhibitions, both solo and group, is 
diverse and very regular since completion of her degree work. She shows with the G Fine Art Gallery in Washington, D.C., but has also shown from coast to coast, a lot of the East uh, Coast in uh, Washington, in Washington, D.C., in the Phillips Collection, at the like, Gallery Joe in Philadelphia, for instance, and at the University of Maryland, but it, it spreads all the way across the state and internationally. So I'd like you to welcome Lynn Myers.
So I spent about three or four months preparing for this project, making um, these uh, preparatory drawings in my studio, and also making a couple of site visits to the museum. Um, the wall's about 20, 21 feet high at the highest point, and the, it's about 70 linear feet in total. I was able to make um, the preparatory drawings that I just showed you and run them through a CAD program, which you see here, so that when I actually began working in the space, I had a clear map of how I was going to um, begin the composition. So that's a little, um, what you just saw there was a little um, pencil mark, the center of one of these large circles. I think the diameter of each circle was about four feet. And I made a big compass with a push pin and a piece of string and drew out the basic, um, the basic uh, structure for the, um, for the painting or for the drawing. Um, so the marker that I'm using there is um, an empty reservoir that I filled with ink. And in this case, I mixed in some marble dust to make the ink more opaque against the dark background there. Um, so you'll notice that at times I lift my hand and, and reposition it and start the line again, those, um, those, those moments are sort of a record of the biomechanics of the body, and they um, leave a trace of my physical limitations. So at the end of the, when the drawing is finished, there'll be little clusters or constellations of these little breaks in the line, which is, is just sort of a mapping of what happens while I'm making the drawing there is symmetrical, you can see. Um, the two sides are inversions of one another. And that's a good shot of the final piece there. And that's a detail. So um, in the next slides, I'm going to show works from a few movements um, in art history, which some of you are probably very familiar with, in order to define how I see my work in the context of art history and the artists who influenced me. Um, I'd like to draw some parallels between my current work and my older work, and I'll also try to put my work into context for you by explaining how some of the movements in art history resonate with me in my process. So this is Jackson Pollock. Um, his uh, gesture and physical process are visible in the finished work. And his gesture and physical process also contain his experience. So when you look at his work, you may see his gesture and you may also have a sense of his experience making the work or some of the forces that led Pollock to paint in that way. I think this alchemy of the artist's gesture evoking an experience in the viewer that might be similar to the experience that the artist had is possible in work that doesn't fit into the traditional definition of abstract expressionism. It can happen in all different kinds of work, and I, I hope that it happens in my work. Um, this is a photograph of Marina Abramovic's performance called The Artist is Present. Um, which she did in 2011 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, I love her work, and one of the things that I love most about what she does is the properties of endurance. So with this piece in particular, she sat in that chair for, I think it was seven hours a day, however long the museum was open. From the moment the museum opened to the moment it closed, every single day for the entire length of the exhibition, and anybody could wait in line to sit with her. And you would just take a seat in the chair. And most people just gazed into her eyes and she gazed back at them. And many people had very um, intense emotional responses to the situation. So, you know, my take on it is that they were really, they weren't being seen by her so much as seeing themselves in her eyes, um, which is an opportunity that most of us don't have most of the time. It was a, it was a pretty incredible
incredible um, performance that she did. <clears throat> and this is a photograph by a photographer named Chris Abbott, it's taken in 1968. It's a stop motion photograph of a pendulum. Um, in this, she's capturing multiple moments and, in a way, attempting to stop time, which of course is futile. Um, I see this as a way of trying to document time through a non-time-based medium, which is one of the things that I also try and do in my work. I love this piece. And this is one of my favorites. It's a, um, a video piece by an artist named um, Guido Vanderberg. And the title is The Day I Didn't Turn With The Earth. So he um, went to the North Pole and stood at the North Pole for 24 hours and turned against the rotation of the Earth. So essentially followed his shadow so that as the Earth turned below him, he turned against it. So he's basically standing still with his movement. Um, and you know, it's it's also it's another work of duration. It's a work that could be understood as a stunt, as a stunt, but it's not a stunt. It shows his dedication to this project, um, and in a way, using his motion to perform an act of stillness. I think it's a really poetic piece. Um, and this is a Vanitas painting from the 17th century. Um, <coughs> some of you may know this work. Uh, the Vanitas painters used uh, symbols of death, the change as reminders of the inevitability of those things. Um, the word actually means empty or state of emptiness in Latin. Um, I, I, I appreciate this work because it addresses some of the same issues that I try and work with in my wall drawings um, by making works that, in, by their sort of basic nature, are ephemeral or you know have a limited lifespan. So, as the Vanitas painting painters were sort of trying to use symbols to represent the, those facts of our existence here on Earth, um, I try to use the fact that the work will only be in existence for a short period of time to address those same um, issues. And um, this is a piece that I painted when I was a junior at Cooper Union. I think it's uh, 1989. Um, and at the time I was making works that were, you could call them magic realism, call them realism. It was um, trying to portray something that was real and in front of my eyes. Um, in this case, scooping up water with my hands and trying to sort of memorize what it looked like as the water seeped out from between my hands, working on the painting and then doing that over and over again. And that is a little bit like Bernice Abbott's photograph of the pendulum, trying to capture particular moment that's fleeting. Um, let's see. Um, the experience and sensations expressed in this work that I made 24 years ago and in my current work are both real. So in a way, rather than considering the work that I do now to be abstract, I actually would put it more in the category of realism. The point being that reality is our entire experience as living beings, not just the visual field that we think of in, in the way that you know, people, artists illustrate what they see in front of them. Um, I think reality can be expressed through work that is non-representational as vividly as it can be expressed through the genre that we refer to as realism. Um, there's one other point that I wanted to make about the slide, which is that I see multiple threads running through my work that go as far back as the paintings that I made in high school. 
And I think that many of us have driven to replay certain concerns for many, many years. Um, of course, it's, it's hard to see this until you have a good vantage point, meaning that you need many years of work to look back on to be able to identify the common threads throughout. Um, in this case, I'd say that the picture portrays hands that are holding something that cannot be held, and that's that idea of trying to contain something which is slipping away that I feel I'm still working with. So on to more current work. This is a project that I did at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. in 2010. It's part of the program that they call Intersections, where they invite contemporary artists to come to the museum, choose work from the permanent collection, and make new work that's a response to uh, the work in the museum. So I chose uh, the painting that's hanging there between the arches. It's uh, Van Gogh's The Road Menders. And um, it was an amazing opportunity. I got to ask them to hang the Van Gogh where I wanted it, <laughs> which is pretty great. Um, so let's see. Oh, and that painting is from 1889. So these are some um, process pictures that I pulled from the video that they made. So the quality is pretty bad, but I just wanted to show you a little bit. The, um, the two pieces of paper taped up there on the wall are preparatory drawings that I did um, while I was preparing for this project. And the uh, white circles on the wall are pencil marks like you saw um, that I had also worked that way for the hammer project. Um, and um, as the drawing progressed, these different drawings appeared and then were buried inside of the larger piece. So this piece, this, these lines turned into these shapes, and those shapes turned into, the, got buried inside this field. Um, and that's the finished piece. So it doesn't look exactly like what we just saw, because the, this is not a good quality image, but that's what the piece looked like when it was finished. Oh, <coughs> and that's another shot. So it was a great experience. And you know the thing about it that was so amazing is that it allowed me to contemplate the idea of what it means to make ephemeral or temporal works within an institution whose goal it is to house works of art and take care of them for future generations. So it kind of exaggerated the whole issue that I'm um, interested in, of the issue of um, permanence, impermanence, and um, our attachment to things, whether they're you know, other people or art or whatever it is we, as human beings, tend to become attached to things. And um, by making a piece like this, in a setting like the Phillips Collection, it really forced this idea on people. A lot of the um, visitors to that museum go there to see um, famous works. The voting party is there, so they go to see Van Gogh or Monet or other great masters. And um, so many of those viewers are uh, people who really value the idea of preserving great works of art. And then they would stumble across what I had done. And you know, this drawing at its core was not intended to last. And um, it, it really it brought to light that, that big difference there and made people think about um, the fact that they you know, had to engage with the piece now because it wouldn't be there any longer. Whereas they can go back and visit the voting party for however long they're alive. Um, it's also important to note that a lot of artists deal with ephemerality as a primary issue, and there are many ways to do that, but I'm choosing to work in a very traditional medium, drawing or painting, um, so that when the piece no longer exists, it's a clear and conscious choice, so the institution paints over the drawing. It's not passive, it's not like it's disappearing ink, or it's, you know, some 
it's it's not sand, it's a drawing like artists have been making since forever. Um, so it's an active choice to end the drawing at a particular time. This is a piece that I made for an exhibition at the University of Maryland in 2009. The show was called Here Today. Uh, for that particular show, I was artist in residence there and they, they built walls for me to make drawings on. So unlike a lot of the other projects that I've done uh, where I'm engaging with existing architecture, in this case, I established the architecture and then drew on it. Um, so this wall is 40 feet, 44 feet long, or was 44 feet long and 10 feet high. Um, and so because they had built the wall for me, when the exhibition ended, they didn't paint over it, they actually demoed the wall, they tore it down, which was um, an interesting experience. Um, and this is um, a drawing that I did in preparation for that project. Um, it's 18 inches by 50 inches, so it's not actually a, a preparatory drawing per se, but um, it was done um, while I was working on figuring out what I was going to make for that university project. And um, you can see the similarities there between the drawing that I did in preparation and the final piece. And this is a detail of the final piece. So I did one other wall drawing for them, um, another piece that they, they built a wall for me. And um, this piece, what each one of those walls, each side was, I think, eight, eight feet high and 12 feet long. So the whole piece was 24 by eight. Um, this is actually a collaborative, a collaborative piece with a sound artist named Richard Chartier. He uh, attached tran transducers to the other side of the sheetrock so that the, the drawing itself became a speaker. And he, um, he composed a synthetic sound piece that kind of emanated in that space there. Um, and this is a preparatory drawing that I did for that project. Um, so you can see the similarities and also how different uh, the drawing becomes when it's on a much larger scale. That's a detail of the piece. <coughs> so this is a project that I did in, in Paris, France, at a small gallery called Paris Concrete, and uh, in 2010. Um, this project was different because I couldn't um, do site visits, so I didn't really know what I was getting into. I had um, five days to make the piece before the show opened. Um, and I had some ideas of what I wanted to do and I knew I wanted to use a really reduced palette, but beyond that, I'd seen pictures of the space and I didn't really know um, exactly what I was gonna make. I spent the first day sitting in the space, making preparatory drawings, feeling a little bit freaked out that I didn't know what my drawing was gonna look like. And then I had three and a half days to, um, to make the wall drawing. So it was a it was definitely one of the more risky projects that I did um, because I didn't know what I was stepping into. And that's one detail. And that's another detail. So it was there was actually a little bit more nuance to the shades of gray. There were warm grays and cool grays. Um, but it's hard to tell on this slide. Um, and this is a project for a show that I had at the Katzen Museum at American University in 2011. The show was titled A Very Particular Moment. Um, this was probably the closest I've ever come to failing on one of my large projects. Um, the preparatory drawings that I had done for this piece weren't scaled well. 
And when I got in there and started working, I realized that the space was much more vast than I had imagined. And I wasn't, as I was working, I was realizing that I wasn't going to be able to cover as much territory with the drawing as I had expected to. Um, so I had to start to shift um, my plan. And um, it ended up pushing me into territory that was very uncomfortable, but in the end I made something that I think is beautiful and that I definitely wouldn't have made otherwise. And um, the project broke open some new ideas for me and new approaches um, that I took back to the studio with me when I was done with this project. So it was you know, an example of you know, finding my edge and then going well beyond it being completely terrified that I would fail and that the opening would happen and that you know people would realize that I had made something that wasn't worthy and um, somehow managing to um, come through in the end. Um, and that's uh, a detail. And another detail. So in this piece, I'd asked the museum to paint the wall gray <coughs> before I started drawing, but for some reason, maybe for budgetary concerns, I'm not sure, they, they left the wall white at the top of the opening on the upper left of this picture. So you can see where the architecture, where there's that kind of um, opening of the wall there, and there's sort of a line going up. And that's just where the, the color of the wall paint changed. Um, and the, the preparatory drawings that I had done started with that piece up at the corner there, kind of tumbling down sort of teetering on the edge of that piece of the architecture. So when I walked in and I saw that that's how they painted the wall, I wasn't sure what to do, but I, I ended up just going ahead as planned and, um, and found this lovely little surprise that when the drawing crossed over into the other color paint, it, it added another level of dimension that I hadn't expected. Um, and that was something that I took with me into the studio after I finished the project. Um, so I realize I haven't been talking that long, but I feel like I've covered a lot of territory and I'd actually really like to have a conversation with you. I'm going to show you some um, slides of the drawings that I do in the studio, um, just to give you a sense of the ways in which they resemble what I've already shown. And <coughs> There's a great exchange of ideas between the wall drawings and the works that I do in the studio, just in terms of my process. Um, every time I finish one of those site-specific pieces, I have a bunch of new ideas. And also, while working in the studio, I have ideas that I want to take um, into galleries and museums to play with um, in the architecture. So this piece is from 2010, and it's 42 inches by 78 inches. And it's ink on mylar, which is, is the primary material that I work with in the studio. And this is a small drawing from the same year. I think it's about 16 inches square. And it's ink and colored pencil on mylar. And this piece is from 2011. Um, it's a lot longer or sort of taller than what you see in the picture because it's intended to be exhibited as a scroll. So the portion of the image rolled up at the bottom there. And this is a more recent piece from 2012. Uh, it's about 47 by 65. Um, you notice that the, the color behind the lines is split in two. So there's the brown, brownish gray color on the bottom and then the blue color at the top with the lighter lines on top. So that's an example of the way in which the, the work that I did at the Katzen Museum seeped into the work that I've done in the studio. And this is a piece that I made a few months ago. Um, 
so many of the things that I've learned while doing those wall drawings are present in this piece. Um, the way in which the shape is floating out in a field of gray, the architectural qualities of the image, which you know, sort of a reflection of having worked with so much architecture when I'm doing wall drawings. Um, and also the way in which the lines on the left side of the, that geometry start to taper off. That was you know, another thing that I learned while I was working in the Katzen Museum that I also worked with um, on the Hammer Project, which was the first piece that I showed you guys. Actually, you know, let me just say one other thing about this. Um, that the gray field behind there, behind the uh, red lines, is painted, and you can really feel the brush strokes there. That's what the lighter areas are. Um, so, you know, the past few years, I'd say, I've, my work has become more painterly, and um, this piece um, is, is very painterly. Um, in fact, I, I only used paintbrushes when I made it, and that was a conscious decision to see if I could actually make a painting. Um, it's about eight feet by nine feet, and I did this uh, last summer. This is the last piece I'm gonna show you, um, but I, I wanna show you a, um, a detail of it there. So you can see at the bottom of the, um, the paint dripping down a little bit. Um, one of my goals with this piece was really to try to lose control. Um, because as much as I can't anticipate exactly how my drawings will emerge from their initial composition, um, I do feel like I have a handle on the process and been working that way long enough now that I have a certain sense of the way things, the way things happen. And what I wanted to do here was um, get out of my um, get out of my comfort zone by using by using materials or tools that I don't usually work with and see how that would affect uh, the outcome. Um, this is the first painting that I've done in a long time or drawing painting that I've done in a long time. Um, I really love drawing and even when I try and make paintings I think they're still drawings. I think drawing is a really direct medium. The drawing tool becomes an extension of my body and um, because of that, I think that it's a wonderful way of getting a point across without very much interference. Um, I guess what I found through both my work in the studio and even more through the site-specific work is that um, when I let go of some of the ideas that I have, ideas that I hold sort of as truths, um, in this case the idea that one draws with a, a drawing implement rather than with a paintbrush, um, I, when I sort of take it to my comfort zone, to my edge, take it beyond my comfort zone, that I, I find that I make my best work. And I think that's part of why I enjoy the wall drawing so much because um, I'm never in a comfort zone when I'm working on those pieces. It's, it's far too tenuous, it's far too um, risky, and, um, and it's exhilarating and a little bit addictive, although I do love working alone in my studio also. So at this point, I, I, I guess we should raise the lights a little bit. And, um, should we raise it? Should, should I do that? Hold on here. Okay. Um, Will you talk about the properties or characteristics that the mylar and the ink have and what that contributes to the process? Yeah, so um, I have a love affair with mylar. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you worked with it, but um, what I use is, um, is made by graphics, plastics. I buy it in 100 yard rolls. And um, it's pretty thick, it doesn't tear, and it has a beautiful sort of toothy quality, like a little bit of roughness on the surface, but it's, um, 
but it's sort of velvety at the same time. And because I work with ink, it just somehow absorbs the ink just enough. So it's not like paper where it sinks into the paper. It sits on the surface, but it gets absorbed by that velvety kind of surface quality. So um, it's just a beautiful material to work on that you know will probably be discontinued at some point because I think it had been used by um, draft people and everything's done on CAD now. So. Um, Anyhow, yeah, that's that's the that's the surface that I usually work on, and then I usually use um, opaque acrylic inks on it. Um, although now and then I play around with other things. It's mostly opaque acrylic inks, and the the particular ones that I like are called FW. I think you can buy them at Utrecht. Um, and when I draw on the wall, I use those empty markers. And sometimes, like in the hammer project, I had to mix in um, some marble dust to make the ink a little beefier so that it sat on top of that dark purple wall. Because it was sort of, the, the wall paint doesn't have the same qualities as mylar. It kind of does want to suck up the color a little bit. So the marble dust prevents that from happening. Yeah. How do you exhibit the works on mylar? I know you saw the scroll was just hanging there, but the other pieces you just showed as, as an image that was flat. Right, right. I didn't show you any installation shots. But um, in general, I pin them to the wall. And um, because most of the works aren't terribly opaque, this, this piece um, you know, is pretty luminous, and the, that uh, background color is pretty thin. Um, let me just go. And this piece is more opaque, but even those areas that are sort of painted down at the bottom there, um, you know, there's light coming through the mylar where, where the paint's not as rich. Um, so I pin them to the wall and I sort of raise them away from the wall on the pins. I use T-pins. So usually the, the drawings are kind of, um, they have some tension on them between the pins so I can pull the thing forward and it sort of hangs with a little distance from the wall so the light can pour through the mylar and then bounce back like, from the wall, back to the back of the drawing. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. Some, um, some collectors even ask me to install them in their homes like that. Um, those are pretty bold collectors uh, without little kids running around with sticky fingers. <laughs> um, and then um, some people choose to frame them, but I, I don't generally frame them. Talk a little bit about how your residencies work. Sure. Um, well, every one has been a little bit different. Um, I've done some residential residencies. So you mentioned the Venus in Omaha, Nebraska. That's an example of a really wonderful residential residency where um, you are given a, a big live workspace, kind of cinematic, white floors, white walls, big open space, lots of windows. And um, a little kitchen and a bathroom and a working bed. And um, I think that residency is about three months long. So you just work while you're there. Um, and there are other artists there at the same time. So depending on the group of artists, there may be dialogue. There may be a lot of dialogue and a lot of parties. Or there may be you know, more um, solo time. Um, so there's that kind of residency. Um, when I was artist in residence at their first born, um, that was a teaching residency. So I um, did programs in the museum with the exhibitions that were there. And then they have a, or they don't have it anymore actually, but they had us um, like a, a studio space so we could go and actually do hands on projects there. Um, and then the, I've done a couple printmaking residencies where I, so when I said at the outset that I do some printmaking, I don't actually run the press anymore. I've sort of lost all of my skills there. So I, um, I love printmaking, but I, I don't feel um, facile enough with materials. So I work with master printers to make the images. And the printmaking residencies that I've done have at the Tamara Institute and the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, I've worked with master printers there to produce additional work. It's been amazing. Um, and then um, the fellowship
fellowship at the Smithsonian was a research fellowship. So um, I had it easy because I actually live in Washington. Most of the fellows there have to come to do their work and figure out a way to stay while we were doing the research. But um, I uh, had a space in the Hirshhorn's uh, library, which isn't a public library. It's like upstairs where the administrative offices are. And then I had um, working relationships with um, curators from different museums. So I got to see um, the collection of, um, so the, the focus of that fellowship was um, research on plasticity of time. So I worked with um, one uh, historian who showed me um, all these objects in the Smithsonian collection that relate to timekeeping. So um, tuning forks, um, pendulums, um, I don't know, I can't, it was just, it was incredible. I could play in the back rooms of these amazing museums. I had access to all the libraries in the Smithsonian, so I could just you know, sit in the library and read books all day. And, um, and then I um, just sort of did an idea exchange with a curator at the, um, the Smithsonian American History Museum that she, her title is Curator of Time. Mm -hmm. And um, so she is mm -hmm. sort of an authority on the history of timekeeping, but sort of the philosophy of time. You know, you can't really remove timekeeping from our philosophy of time, and it has changed dramatically over the centuries. So that was um, a big part of what I did also, was just sort of have a dialogue with her. It was a really rich experience. Um, so that's sort of, a smattering of my experience too. Yeah. I've noticed a lot of your work is left untitled. Is there a reason why? So um, I title the wall drawings um, because the wall drawings are exhibitions in and of themselves. And I like to title my shows. Um, I don't, I don't title the work that I make in the studio. I don't title my prints. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's a very conscious decision that I want, um, I want my audience, I don't want to, I don't want to lead them into a conclusion of what the piece is. So I, I think there's enough information in the drawings to, um, to give them an opportunity to, um, meander through and interpret it any way that they want to. Um, I love this, this one person came into my studio one time, I was preparing for a show at the Frick Museum, and I had these giant pieces up that I was making for their rotunda, and uh, she didn't, she, I don't think this person had ever looked at art, she was a friend, <laughs> friend and she said, oh, are these paintings of the wind? So if I had titled them Paintings of the Wind, then it would have nailed it down, but instead it was a, you know, sort of an open-ended situation. And they weren't Paintings of the Wind, they were just, you know, they were drawing the but the fact that it was, um, it had not been nailed down, and it left an opportunity for her to just interpret it however she wanted to. That's kind of an example of um, what I'd like. Have any of your wall drawings been permanent? Um, so far, no. Um, by design, they haven't been. I haven't really wanted to do anything permanent. Um, I have done uh, a couple commissioned works for public spaces. I did a piece for um, Arlington, Virginia, in their um, courthouse plaza um, that's in glass and that is permanent. Um, um, it was etched glass, so I actually, in that case, I didn't work on site. I worked with a fabricator, um, and I, I did one other etched glass piece. But, um, you know, the wall drawings, the, I think of them as, they have a performative aspect, so, you know, they're partially performance, like a performance that you don't actually get to witness. As soon as you see the piece, you, you can recognize that there was a performance there, and that they, you know, there was a duration of process there. And, and then to take that, and for people to understand that, you know, the, 
there's this massive chunk of time spent making this very large piece and that it isn't prominent. You know, people go into these spaces knowing that, well, but that, that wasn't here before and I don't think it's going to be here next time I come. Um, is so much a part of how I think about those works. Um, that if I am asked to do a piece like that, that would be permanent. But I think that the process of um, planning the piece and executing the piece will just be very different. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it because obviously I make work that is intended to be permanent. I mean, that's what I do in the studio. But um, it's, it, the, so far the works that I've done, the site-specific works that I've done, have just been these you know, incredible opportunities to explore all these ideas of ephemerality um, that I don't get to do otherwise. So, yeah. Do you document the destruction of your work? Like, um, no. No. I don't, and I'm usually not present. I happen to be present when they were um, taking the uh, sledgehammer to the wall at the uh -huh. University of Maryland. Um, only because I squeezed one last visit in with, um, with a curator. So the curator and I were sitting there talking about the work um, <laughs> in the back. I could hear them taking down one of the walls. Was, was that a down. personal uh, experience for you to see your work destroyed? Because uh, you, you, you build it with the idea that it will be destroyed. Yeah. But do you ever just sit there and you have to experience that destruction? Um, you know, I, for me, that is not where, that's not where the drawing ends. So the drawing, there's two endings for me. There's the end when I draw the last line. And that's where I kind of say goodbye to the piece. So that might be a slightly emotional moment because my relationship with it is sort of over. Um, and then the other end is the end when I guess I'm dead or <laughs> like maybe where I have really bad dementia and I can't remember it <laughs> or, but it's but it's you know that the point with that is that you know these things these things the sound so important these things live inside of us and so you know if you want to go visit then goes the road vendors you know, you can go visit that painting over and over again, but the truth is that once you leave the gallery, it's still, you still, it still exists for you, inside of you. And, and, you know, what I'm trying to do is sort of exaggerate that experience by making the work temporary so that, you know, if you're there and you know that you're only going to see that piece once, you're, you're more likely to take it in in a more intense way and not take it for granted and you go back to it. So then you really eat it up and sort of, like in the way that I had to scoop the water up and look at it each time and then drop the water and make the painting, it's like you have to take it in and hold it and, you know, hopefully if somebody, if the wall might resonate with someone, that's what they'll do when they leave the museum or gallery. So, I don't know if I answered your question. Very well. I don't know what you asked me. <laughs> I really appreciate the relationship between the hand drawing and what you're doing now. I'm wondering if you could fill in the gaps a little bit with how you got from the hand drawing to the yeah. recent work. Um, in some ways very circuitously and in other ways not. Mostly because, I guess not because when I look at that painting even though the painting, you know, the the picture is so different than what I make now. I really see the same stuff. Um, so, like I mentioned, that piece was done my junior year in college. I was doing a lot of um, figurative work like that, um, that was sort of from life, but sort of magical realism. Um, and some of them, there was also landscape. And then I, um, 
I started to drop out the figurative elements, so I was making some magical, realist landscape paintings for a while. Um, I was doing that after I finished college and into my first year in graduate school. And I went to graduate school in California in the Bay Area where I don't, it's not so much like this anymore, but at the time, everybody was an activist. And everybody had, you know, their cause. And if you were making landscape paintings, then you were like an activist for the earth. And not that, I, not that that's not important to me, but that was not what my paintings were supposed to be. That's not how I wanted people to understand what I was making pictures of. And um, I had a great mentor there. His name was Dennis Leon, who was a sculptor. And he, you know, he asked me why I was making landscape paintings, and my ex explanation was a little bit lame. It was sort of, you know, it's a metaphor for a blah, blah, blah. And he encouraged me to just drop the horizon. So, you know, if you can picture a slightly abstracted landscape, something kind of bleak, and then, you know, you just take the horizon out, just chop off that piece of the picture, what you're left with is a sort of environment that you still read as a surround, but you don't attach it to nature in the same way. And so, um, the, what happened was I found that if I just moved into the environment, so rather than looking at a landscape from a distance, I moved into the landscape, the horizon disappeared, and it became a surround. And so that was sort of the mode in which I worked for a few years, and as I explored that, um, the paintings became, like, I guess for a while I was painting events, so, but then the painting became the event, and then the action of making the painting became the event, so the gesture became the event, and, and you know, not dissimilar from the way that Jackson Pollock's gesture is an event, and the paintings become that, and, um, and then um, when I moved back to the East Coast, I, was, I began to refine that. And what I found was that my environment living in New York, where, and that was, that was the mid-90s, everything was really slick then. You know, there was a lot of emphasis on um, like the painting as a commodity, and things were becoming very slick. And I found my paintings becoming slick because they had become the sort of um, repetitive, um, gestural surround. And I, even though I kind of liked the impulse, I did like the product of the impulse. Um, and um, so to overcome that, um, they became, I guess I allowed them to become more organic. And then slowly I brought um, transparency into them. So I started working with um, layers of transparent material, scrims. I was making scrim paintings for a while. Um, I was trying to get away from illusion, which is funny because the painting of my hands cupping the water is all about the illusion in some ways. But I didn't want to make, I, I wanted to make paintings that were honest, and at that time it seemed like making pictures of something was dishonest because what it was was a painting. And um, so, let's see, what happened then? I, um, I started using these transparent layers, but then found that for me that was an illusion. For me that was very real. It was depth rather than depicting depth. But it was sort of backfired because then my viewers became completely kind of attached to this idea of the depth in the piece and not knowing where it was coming from and it becoming an illusion for them. So I had to drop that and go back to a single surface that I uh, would work on. And that's sort of where the mylar came in. And, um, you know, the whole question of illusion is still a sticky point for me because I think, um, you know, what I see when I look at my work is I see the process. I see 
the individual lines. I see how the individual lines respond to one another. I see the time that I spent making it. I see the doubt. But when other people look at it, they see aerial landscape, and they see folds, and they see texture and movement. And so here I am again with illusion that I can't quite get away from. But I, I think that part of that is kind of the nature of a lot of painting. So I don't concern myself with it as much as I used to. So that is kind of the journey from these very illusionistic, kind of magical realist pieces. Even back in high school, I made work like that, all the way through to these pieces that are still strangely full of illusion, but really made that all of that illusion is a result of a very simple process. And the work is entirely attached to that process. There's no way to make it without that. Yeah. Do you still see them as landscapes? Uh, that's a good question. I really, um, you know, it's, it, until just a few years ago, I um, I was so averse to references outside of the work itself. You know, I really was dedicated to the idea that the work was non-representational, but and and it is from from where I sit, like it, it is non-representational as I plan it and as I work on it. The only thing that it represents is the, the time that I'm spending. But I also have come to accept the fact that human beings want to find something identifiable in what they look at. <coughs> it's just a natural human impulse. So if somebody sees rolling waves, or if somebody sees whatever landscape, whatever, you know, I, I, I embrace that, but it's not, I don't, I don't think of them that way. I really think of my work as a continuum. I really think of each piece as a result of what I've already been working on, and as sort of a reflection of what I've been doing, and as a response to itself. So um, that piece that I, I think I showed you a piece that, yeah, the piece that I showed you that has the uh, horizon line in it. Actually, this piece originally was horizontal, so that wasn't a horizon line. It was a vertical break in the field of color behind the lines. And um, I was totally comfortable with that. It had a sort of geometric architectural element, you know, the, the darker side. It was so that the blue was on the right. And it kind of created almost like a sense of a corner in the painting. But the once I started drawing the lines, it just compositionally, it didn't want to be that way. It wanted to be vertical. And it took me a couple weeks to make peace with this horizontal. Um, line that ended up being there. I had to actually, I wasn't going to show it to anyone. I finally showed it to someone who I really trust, and, and another artist, and he said, oh, don't worry, 